Nothing could be more tranquil than the English countryside here on the Durham-Northumberland border. I was contacted not long ago by a gentleman who told me about the death of a sheep not far from where I'm standing. Nothing unusual about that, you might think. The ewe had died during the process of giving birth to a lamb. It was found with the lamb's head protruding from its body. The following morning, when the farmer went to retrieve the carcass, she was horrified to discover that the head of the lamb was missing and a portion of skin and flesh had been removed from the left jaw and face of the ewe. The injuries were unlike those made by a predator and appeared to have been carried out with surgical precision. I'd heard about strange mutilation of cattle in the United States in the past and decided to find out more about cases here in the UK. I started by contacting an organisation called the Animal Pathology Field Unit, who are a group of researchers that investigate strange animal deaths throughout the United Kingdom with the intention of finding a plausible explanation. One of the founding members, David Caton, a retired British aerospace engineer and formerly RAF photographer, has been investigating unexplained animal deaths since 1997. He invited me to his home for a chat. Well, I got to hear about um, a gentleman, an ex-police sergeant called Tony Dodd, who uh, operated in North Yorkshire, and I think he did like 25 years in the police service, and uh, he started publicly talking about uh, these animal mutilations. So I contacted him, and he um, filled me in quite a bit. Some of the information, I suppose, from police sources, which perhaps he shouldn't have mentioned, and ultimately, uh, he provided some images to me to, to, to demonstrate just what was happening. Uh, those images, incidentally, I now have in my possession because Tony sadly died recently. Uh, and uh, then I heard via um, internet and other things of a lady, in, an investigative journalist in America called Linda Moulton Howe, who had done sterling work and run into accidentally into cattle mutilations mm -hmm. because Linda is very much into environmental issues mm -hmm. and suddenly stumbled on this th phenomena herself mm -hmm. and produced a documentary on it which was a sort of groundbreaking thing which she won an Emmy Award so I got a copy of that and having viewed that I thought wow uh, this is very interesting particularly because it was pointed out by her and Tony that this was not happening just in America, as lots of people believe, it's just it's all over the world and uh, in this country. So we had a little meeting and there were three or four of us and we decided to work as a team um, to try and improve the hit rate, if you like, and the, the foot slogging work in the fields to respond to uh, calls from animal owners of a, a, an animal loss. So uh, we decided to give ourselves a name and we decided, I think it was Phil Hoyle's uh, suggestion was the best, of Animal Pathology Field Unit, APFU. Mm -hmm. And we felt uh, legitimately that we could apply the pathology label because of the assistance I've been having by uh, pathologist Tony Fremont. So I compiled and drafted a, uh, an advert, an appeal for carcasses uh, for the farming press. Um, I thought it was important to list, you know, nine or ten or so of the principal modus operandi injuries. So I got probably about 15 to 20 very interesting calls. So what is the modus operandi of these bizarre animal deaths? David Caton provided me with a list of injuries which are commonly found. The side of the head and jaw is completely and cleanly stripped of all flesh, skin and hide usually on the left side of the head. Usually, always, not say always, but often the left side. So the animal's found lying on its right side, and there's a very neat strip round from the ear and the eye, right down to the nose, very often, and back on the lower jaw, where all the skin and tissue is removed very cleanly from the bone. So the bone is, is pristine, it's, it's like, People have described it in the States as though the animal's been dead for months, laid out in the desert, being picked clean by coyotes and so on, and birds, and left to bleach in the sun. Uh, 
some time ago I'd have a conversation with a chap who worked in an abattoir uh, down in South Wales and um, he said to do that with his difficulty in an abattoir we would have to use high pressure steam and very hot steam to clean all the flesh without trace off a bone to leave it in that sort of condition. One or both ears are cleanly removed. The tongue is removed from the root or often a slightly angled cut which removes a small slice down from the tip. If you cut your tongue, you bite your tongue mm -hmm. and you're living, you bleed like heck. Right. <laughs> uh, and it's very messy and uh, apart from, I have one picture where it looks, suggests that the lamb was still alive when the tip of the tongue was sliced off because it's quite bloody around its mouth but all the others, there's no blood whatsoever, which is indicative of the animal being obviously dead before that particular slice was cut away from the tongue. Right. So yeah. the, the, do you think that they're cutting part of the tongue off in order to extract blood, or is, have you got a thought on why they remove <laughs> the tongue or part of the tongue? Yeah, well, it, yes. It, it has been suggested to me by a lady who uh, works in a pathology lab in Birmingham, from Birmingham Hospital, who said that the tongue, uh, the health of the, of the animal, uh, and even human beings, can be judged quite well by the state of the tongue. Right. I mean, you go to the GP and you're feeling off colour, and often the first thing they say to you is, stick your tongue out, right. and they look at your tongue. Right. So it might be that the tissue from the tongue would tell the people who are removing these organs about the general health of the animal, which could be important one or both eyes are removed. Neat circular holes drilled through the center of the skull. Brain material is extracted via these holes. On the head and neck, one to two inch diameter shallow scoops through the skin with just a few millimeters of flesh removed. Inside these areas, smaller quarter inch diameter deeper holes can be found. Organs removed from the throat, such as the larynx and esophagus. A pair of small puncture wounds an inch apart in the ventral neck area from which 100% of blood volume is extracted. There is no explanation of how this can be achieved. If you cut yourself badly and you're bleeding, when about 60% of your blood is lost, mm -hmm. then the heart stops and you die. Because mm -hmm. uh, the cardiovascular system apparently collapses then mm -hmm. and that's the end of you or the animal. Yeah. So the big mystery is what happens to the other 40 odd percent mm -hmm. and how is that removed mm -hmm. uh, without the heart acting as a pump yeah. you know to pump it out so some very sophisticated external apparatus mm -hmm. must be being brought to bear mm -hmm. to, to, to do that. Neat edged circular and teardrop shaped holes in the abdomen from which all or some of the major organs are removed there is no explanation as to how large organs are removed through these small holes. Um, holes are cut into the, into the body and organs and tissues are cleanly removed from quite, you know, big organs from quite small holes. Excision of reproductive organs. Neat edged holes in the rectal area which are cored out to a depth of five to six inches. Cows may have complete excision of the udder or just missing teat portions. Decapitations and limb or tail amputations. The severed items are never found. Complete or partial removal of the internal organs. Usually other animals will not scavenge from these carcasses and other animals grazing in the same field will keep well clear of the dead animal. Well, we're all, I suppose, after the same basic truth of what's going on and, and finding the evidence and examining the evidence. Phil has uh, latterly uh, decided to uh, trawl uh, an area south uh, east of Shrewsbury and down to the Welsh borders, um, farm by farm, in a sort of grid pattern in a way, because it's quite clear there seems to be an area of high activity. And I think he's done like over a hundred farms so far. One farmer, his father, was in his 80s, said, 
Well, we've been having this trouble since 1954. A lot of these cases are in small pockets. It seems to be that the, the Ree Valley area is, has got an intensity and, and we find that in other parts of the country. It doesn't seem to be the complete country that's active. It seems to be certain areas. But what reasons that would be, we're not sh quite sure at the moment. So this is an area on the English-Welsh border called the, the Ree Valley. That's right. And there's another one, another valley nearby called the Hope Valley. That's right, that runs parallel to it. But those particular areas are extremely active uh, and obviously there's been a lot of uh, animal mutilations detected and also missing animals in that area over the past 10 years. The majority of these mutilations do take in very isolated areas and uh, on hill farms in particular. Another active location is an area within Dartmoor. Mike Freebury explains. Well, this is an attack map of the Dartmoor sheep killings and each dot represents an attack. Sometimes there's seven victims, sometimes there's three, sometimes there's only one. But it's a very, very small area. Uh, you've got here Pork Hill leads up. This is the main B3357 that leads to Princetown. And this area here where the majority of ta attacks have taken place is no more than half a mile square. So we'll target areas of known activity and then go around in, in a pre-organised search pattern calling on farms to explore if they've had any unusual animal deaths or disappearances. We do know that on one occasion a, a victim was taken from a field over here and transported to the killing area where it was mutilated and killed. It's referred to as animal mutilation, but that's probably a very misleading term. Yes. A Can you explain yeah. why? It's a complete misnomer because the word mutilation conjures up in people's minds uh, a vision of a, a poor animal torn to pieces and blood everywhere uh, and, and being a mess, which is what often happens when a natural predator obviously attacks an animal to eat, which is a, a natural process. So um, but these are very clinical, medical type procedures. David gives an example of one of these medical type procedures. As they were walking up the field, with the yards from the farmhouse, one evening back home, his younger daughter said, oh daddy, look at this little lamb here, dead. Mm -hmm. And he got this rather interesting teardrop shaped hole on its left hindquarters. Okay. So, having got the children back to the farm and tucked away, he went back and took some pictures and contacted me and sent them to me. But that is a very, very interesting image because it shows this particular shape of hole which I found subsequently on an uh, abdomen of a ram in West Wales, which I will show you the images later. Right. And the, the smooth edges again, and how they, for about a half inch area around this teardrop shaped hole, which was, you know, quite big, yeah was cleaned away just to the bare skin, so all the fur and everything, as though it had been prepared for surgery. A misconception to think that the animals have been attacked or vicious, vicious, viciously uh, wounds inflicted upon them, that's not the case. Uh, when the farmers normally uh, detect that the animal is, is obviously being killed, uh, the first examination they sometimes feel, oh, it's been killed by a, a fox or a badger. Sometimes animals have been clinically killed and then a predator might come in and have an easy meal and contaminate the evidence. But a lot of times, things aren't touched at all by predators. Predators keep away. Now, these are surgical procedures. They are clinical, remo clinical removal of the, the tongue, the, the jaw strips, and also circular incisions around the groins and reproductive organs. So these are highly clinical, precise removal of tissue and organs. Because one of the highlights of, of animal mutilation cases is that the tongue is invariably removed and usually by a smooth cut to the back of the mouth. So she went to check the body and came back and said all the blowflies are dead, there's piles of them in the back of the car, in the back of her Land Rover. Okay. Uh, and I've actually got a photograph of that. Okay, so something was, something was possibly put on the body or done to the body which, which, which killed, which killed the, the, the flies which were... Killed the predators. Okay. And it is not consistent with any predatory attack that we can determine at all. And quite often drained of blood too. Well the, the blood seems to be missed in, in the context it's not on the carcass or very little and it's not on the ground. 
uh, on a number of cases I've, I've examined carcasses of ewes, which are quite big animals, and they've had substantial uh, removal of tissue, and there's not even one single drop of blood on the ground, and the farmer even make that comment. Mm -hmm. that is, there should be blood everywhere. Mm -hmm. If you've, you've opened up major arteries and removed organs and tissue, there should be blood all over the carcass, mm -hmm. and, and it's like the carcass is dry. And, and, and the blood is itself removed as well, and there's no there, trace. There is an indication that, uh, that in many cases the blood is removed. There's also evidence from the US that the blood might also have been actually altered. That, that, that actually the, the, the blood plasma has been broken down and separated off into its components. And the actual substance of the blood, in a number of cases in America, have, have actually been found in, in a type of black putty or paste upon the carcass. We've actually detected that also in the Ree Valley and another case where an unwanted item was left behind. Where the one ear had gone completely, the tag, which is sealed, which when the animal has it clamped to, like an earring, yes. they're clamped and they're for life. Right. And it takes a lot of force to unclamp them. You damage and destroy the tag in doing that, as the farmer explained to, her, to Phil and I. Um, and there is the tag lying on the ground alongside the carcass of the animal, completely undamaged. Right. And there's no evidence of tissue or blood around it. Right. So that's a And was the, was the ear damaged? Was the ear cut so that that could have been removed? Well, probably the ear was totally missing. Right. Oh, so the ear was completely missing. Right. Yeah, but the, the, they've gone to the trouble of removing the, the, plastic tag. the plastic tag as though this was some problem to them. They didn't want that. Yeah. But how it's been removed is in a mystery in itself. David points out similarities with other cases from around the world. This is a classic uh, cow mutilation compiled to the States, mm -hmm. which again came from Tony Dodd in the States from 1995 right. in, uh, in Newry. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's got a complete excision of the, the udder. Also, there was excision of the vaginal area mm -hmm. at the back and uh, the rectum yeah. and it also had jaw strips and the classic stuff tongue on or what have you but what was the blood removed uh, well presumably it looks pretty bloodless okay. I would say but yeah. as you can see possibly on there the, the jaw strip off underneath yeah. um, and then if I compare these two images this is a cow in the States um, not sure for me, but I think it might be Alabama or somewhere. Mm -hmm. But also has had the the udder removed, mm -hmm. slightly larger excision area, right. but the same sort of thing with the clean edges yeah. and the circular sort of thing. So there we are, thousands of miles apart. Yeah. Phil Hoyle examines a mutilated lamb in the Ree Valley. That the tongue has been cut clean off, and see inside. See inside the blood. The tongue has been. You can see it's been cleanly, sharply removed. About a number of inches from the end. One eye. Is it just just the, the right eye? Yeah. Just the right eye is gone. There's also a, uh, some sort of opening to the. Have you got that, Phil? Yeah. Hang on. As so we've viewed this, clean, clean incision. Yeah, clean, clean incision there above the uh, right thigh, hindquarter, into the rectal area. All the rectal area is, is surgically, the whole cavity is totally empty. Yeah, totally empty. Obvious inaccessibility by road to this area. David Caton reports on a case from the Severn Estuary where a large number of sheep were mutilated. There was reports initially of 40 injured animals, 16 dead. Um, this happened on... And the location is on the Severn Estuary, mm -hmm. uh, on the Forest of Dean side. So you're on the northern side of the estuary between Lids Lydney and Chepstow. Mm -hmm. And across the river, which is a mile and a quarter direct, is the Albury on Seven nuclear power station, yeah. which I think might be interesting, because the farmer th just threw in a sort of a conversation that 
local people around him had been notified that they were soon to be given dished out iodine tablets, which suggests there being a sort of radiation leak from the power station, <coughs> which could affect people, you know, and lower your uh, red corpuscle count and all the rest of it, which is disturbing in itself. But, uh, so he brought them in from this location about two miles away because the farmers rent fields out to each other. So the field where it was, which was like between the, the uh, estuary, which is tidal there, there was a railway track. So it was like a 300 yard wide strip, about three quarters of a mile long. And that was the field contained by the river. Um, so the only access was off two, two other farmers' fields to cross the railway crossing to get onto that strip of land. And that's where he found them after a night of torrential rain. Mm -hmm. So it was w w boggy, windy. The farmer, Willie Guest, said, I wouldn't like to have been out there. So the suspicion was, and this was reported on the television news from Bristol, that uh, some people with firearms and dogs possibly had walked up the railway track, <coughs> gone into the field, somehow herded the animals together this is in the dark, mind you, in a wet, horrendous night, and shot with a, a low-caliber rifle the animals in the heads, right. which turned out to be absolute nonsense. But because the police were informed they were duty obliged, I suppose, to follow up this line of inquiry, because firearms had been suggested to be used. Right. So the RSPCA attended, apparently, a big cat expert, a fellow called uh, Danny Bamping from the British Big Cat Society, who declared, so the farmer told me, to the TV camera people, crew were there, that it was not the work of big cats, and he disappeared. The RSPCA were mystified and were more interested in making a plug uh, for the public watching the TV news to get funds for the RSPCA, which is what they do. So the farmer was absolutely fuming about it because he's lost all his animals with no real explanation. So the CID came back in, we happened to meet two of them, and a vet from a practice in Chepstow, a lady called Jane Glover Hill, appeared, armed with a big knife, to detach the heads of four of the animals and take a whole one, which I helped her in the car boot with, back to the uh, veterinary practice to conduct some radiography on the heads to look for evidence of lead shot. Right. Um, was, uh, and there, there was, was there any evidence no, of lead shot? No, absolutely none at all. Clean as a whistle. And did, and so. did these have any of the mutilation signs? Any of the, the, of the 14? No, yes, in a sense, when I heard of this, I rang, I, got, I rang the TV people in Bristol who gave me the name of the farmer. So I rang him said I'm in Manchester, 200 miles all the way, and said, did any of the animals in this big heap mm -hmm. on his tractor yeah. have a jaw strip? Yeah. And he said, oh yes, yes, I think you're right, they did, they did. So I said, can you go and check to see if the tongue is missing? Right. So he said, oh, okay. So he put the phone down, and after about, I don't know, half an hour, he came back on the phone to me and said, absolutely amazed, he said, you're right, the tongue's missing. So he thought, how do I know, 200 miles away, I haven't clapped eyes on these animals, yeah. and know that the tongue was missing, you know, because you've got to force the jaw open to see that, because rigor mortis starts to set in, yeah. which makes it hard to open the jaw. So he was, he was clearly intrigued, so that was enough. She invited me and Robert to go back with him to Chepstow, mm -hmm. before we headed back up north, while they did some of the radiography. So, um, and that proved that they were, firearms were not used, mm -hmm. categorically but she found some very interesting wounds. And these were crushing injuries, lots of them on the head mm -hmm. and the jaw and the, the nasal bone down the front of the animal was sort of splintered. Um, there was no other damage elsewhere, there was no rectal chlorine, uh, no other body parts affected, it was all the head right. and the neck. So it's, it seems that sometimes they, they, they're just interested in the head end and did they, take the, did they take the soft tissue organs from the throat and, no, and, and the esophagus? No, 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 no. So, okay. There was neat shallow holes, one under the jaw in the centre, one of the sheep, 
they all had a mixture. Mm -hmm. I mean, some had no injury at all, but the right. farmer said, often they're stressed. Sheep are very prone to dropping dead with a heart attack. Right. So, so something has stressed them out. Uh, this is the jaw strip, <coughs> which is right. similar but different in some respects to the other animals elsewhere. Uh, th but we found holes behind the ears. When you pull the ears back, mm -hmm. there were these holes in the skin, mm -hmm. which had some depth. Uh, and then across there was a particular black one, which I'll turn to, which, this one, mm -hmm. which had a diagonal strip of the tongue, mm -hmm. there and there, and then little holes in the side of the, the face. Yeah. And then, by accident, by pulling the carcass about, yeah which uh, I found was a split between the ears. I tossed the crop of the, the skull, which looked like a, a neat cut, but when I pulled the, the skin back, it revealed, I think, the top of the cranium. Right. And the side under the ears, these larger holes, there was a smaller hole in the centre, or not necessarily in the centre, but in, within this hole. Right. Now, this photograph with the head detached, Jane Glover Hill, discovered, with dissection I guess eventually, that these two holes were in the side of the head, a bit similar to the lamb from Shropshire, mm -hmm. but deeper, within the, the bigger hole. Right. Um, and she found that they seemed to line up. And uh, she actually passed an implement through from one side to the other, which was a knitting needle actually, right. Right. Uh, which she, she suggested a clamping device had been forcibly, and a lot of force, she said, would have been applied mm -hmm. to press these two appeared to be blind holes, but diametrically opposite, right. each side of the head. And then this had missed the top of the brain that came out the other side. Right. Albeit, she did say, in death, the brain shrinks at a modicum, right. which leaves a bit of a gap between the brain and the top of the skull, if you see what I mean. Right. But that clearly was not done by a bullet. The main thrust of it was to eliminate firearms right. and that's really all they were interested in doing. That was the veterinary practices brief to eliminate the firearms. And Once that was done the police lost right. interest. Right. The case was closed. So they know, nobody had any answer to it basically. Right. And farmers have said to me more than once for you to catch an animal, particularly in a herd, I mean, they have difficulty getting one to give it some treatment, mm -hmm. you know, an injection or something, or do something to its foot, hair, you know. And that's why they say we have sheepdogs to help us do it. Yeah. Now, to round them up, they herd them into a small area where they were found. Uh, there's some pictures taken by the big cat mine, which I've got from the farmer, shows like where they were laying, obviously covered in mud and slime. You know, they were a mess. So that the, you can imagine the pitch dark, in the rain, terrible rain, wind blowing a gale, the sheep would be jostling about to, to, to be able to go in there with a firearm, with a, with a, a rifle of some sort, to, to keep them steady, to, to, to fire weapons into the heads of these animals, it would be ridiculous, yeah. if not impossible. And apart from endangering yourself, shooting yourself literally in the foot in the process. Another peculiar fact of this phenomena is that it is not just farm animals that are at risk. Wild animals, birds and sea animals are also victims. The evidence is showing that it's all wildlife generally, from small animals, even mice, hedgehogs. I've got a picture of a hole in the centre of a hedgehog, which you might like to look at. Um, so the wild animal, including the fox and the badger, who are both predators, to lambs, for example, uh, also fall victim to this sort of uh, mutilation. Um, so so you've domestic got the whole animals? D domestic animals, cats, dogs, uh, rabbits. But then it goes up all the other way to cattle, to uh, bison, for example, in Canada, mm -hmm. um, elk, mm -hmm. um, deer or up in Scandinavia. Uh, even to sea mammals like uh, dolphins, um, uh, seals, uh, seals, yes, yep. yes, seals. There was a case in Orkney a few years ago, which Tony Dodd told me about, where the decapitated seals were found on Orkney beaches, mm 
mm -hmm. completely bloodless man. You'd have seen would have possibly washed the blood away, but mm -hmm. they were all decapitated cleanly through the same IV joint in the vertebrae. Right. Now you imagine when people postulating that it was people with a big hatchet or a, a saw or something, yeah. you've got a seal on the beach, assuming you've got to catch a seal in the first place. Yes. How do you blind, without real-time radiography, imaging yeah. of some sort, see where to position your blade to cut through thick blubber yeah. the seals have around the neck yeah. to hit the same joint in the vertebrae? Yeah. Not once, but a dozen or more times. I was interested to find out more about this problem worldwide, so I telephoned investigative journalist Linda Moulton Howe in the US, who has spent years looking into the animal mutilation phenomena. Hi Linda, this is Richard Hall here. Yes. How are you? Good. Good. Uh, as you know, I, um, I've been investigating the phenomena of animal mutilation here in the UK, and um, David Caton mentioned your name when I interviewed him, and I thought... Um, it would be good to get a perspective from of somebody who's investigated this from a, from another country. Um, when did you first become aware of, of the mutilation phenomena? I was director of special projects for the CBS television station in Denver, Colorado, uh, and the summer of 1979. I was working on a, uh, a particular documentary for the station because that was my role as director of special projects. I had an audio guy who had just come off of a uh, TV production for the brand new ABC Network 2020 program that was just starting then. And he said, I've just done a show in which they shot over 100,000 feet of double system film about unusual animal deaths in which there are no tracks, there's no blood. He was going through, an ear is missing, the eye is missing, the tongue is missing, jaw flesh is missing, udder or testicles and penis are removed, and the rectum is cored out, and the vaginal tissue is taken. All of this... Uh, happening in many places in the United States. And I only had a glancing uh, knowledge about this from uh, newspaper headlines. And now I'm talking to my audio guy who has come off of an ABC network shoot. I said, well, when are they going to air this? And he said, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I called as director of special projects for the CBS station, ABC in New York, explained who I was, that uh, Mark O'Kane was working for me, uh, when were they going to air this uh, network program about animal mutilation? And the executive producer I was talking to, uh, this would have been like around August of 1979, said, oh, we scrapped that because we're in the business of news and we could never come up with an answer. Okay. And that really got my attention. I immediately turned my attention uh, to starting phone calls with sheriffs, and I went to see a sheriff who had retired up in northern Colorado, and for an entire day, he told me about the incredible experiences that he had had investigating so many animal mutilations between 1973 and when he retired in 1979 that he said often in the year of 1975, we were going to three cattle mutilations a day. The bodies were warm to touch, they were so fresh, and yet it was exactly the same MO. Ear missing, eye missing, circle of flesh taken around the eye, half of the jaw flesh usually, or all of the jaw flesh, the tongue removed deep within the throat, uh, the genitals, male or female, removed, and that was the standard description of what law enforcement called animal mutilation. That is not my term, that is law enforcement term. Mm -hmm. That was being reported around the world from at least the 1960s, if not earlier. In almost every case, the meat of the carcass, which a poacher would be most interested in, is left behind. It is the soft tissue organs which are taken. They seem to work, go for the digestive tract mm -hmm. um, uh, and the rectal area. Soft tissue the organs. The soft tissue, 
So it's all this studying what's happening to the food they're ingesting, you know, they're eating the grass in the field, which is either contaminated maybe by pesticides, chemicals, airborne pollutants, like radiation fallout, for example. Tissue that's removed is not really anything that's beneficial to a predator. It's not a meat or some sort of food that's going to be actually eaten for sustenance. So something else is taking the, these parts of the animals for another reason. So, and we, we have consulted with people in, in the national health and, and with surgeons and people who, who actually st study uh, different diseases. And we ask them, why would you be looking, or anybody be looking for certain uh, soft, tissue soft tissues, yeah. uh, for instance, the part of the tongue or, or the part of the throat in as much like the tonsils. We draw a connection to the, uh, to the sampling uh, uh, of BSE. In as much with BSE, uh, there was a concentration of that agent within the spinal column, uh, the tonsils, and bone marrow. And, the, and what we're told by people we ask in the National Health is that it's like somebody is, or something is looking for something within the animal. And they're, and they're looking in these particular areas to try and detect it. In one particular case, four sheep were found dead, but only three had the classic mutilation injuries. David Caton examined the seemingly healthy sheep. And I found, uh, I have an image of this actually, you might like to look at yeah. later, two very small, couple of millimetre holes between the eye and the ear, sort of there, um, when I turned it over, I found one on the opposite side, um, and that's all I could find. Right. Uh, but whether that had something to do with it being put to death, I have no idea. So for some reason, so, um, you know, wh yeah. whoever did this wasn't interested yeah. in that particular lab. Yeah, when, when it was examined in the laboratory later by pathologist Professor Tony Fremont, mm -hmm. he, in fact his first reaction was they looked a bit like 0 0.22 pellet mm -hmm. holes. And he was quite surprised to find, uh, when he removed the skin, etc., working down to the skull, that the hole only penetrated just into the skin and the flesh. In fact, the bone, he said, was not marked whatsoever. Right. So whatever was applied each side to the head of the lamb hadn't penetrated hard enough to damage the bone underneath the, the, the flesh. There appears to be a high degree of consistency in some of these medical type procedures. Uh, I have a, a measuring stick. Right. Um, to measure the depth. Yes. yes. Marked off right. in, in inches, right. and half inches. Um, sounds a bit odd, but uh, yeah. so I then passed that into the anal area right. and found it was five and a half inches. Right. And I find that depth in a lamb of young age to be the same every time. So that is indicative of the coring implement right. to be set somehow to, to, to measure and extract the right proportion of the digestive system right. each time. You're probably extremely curious to get to the bottom of what's going on here. So how do you, you know, eliminate um, the different um, explanations that people come forward with? For example, um, it's just a satanic cults who are killing these animals for their sacrifices and their taking their blood, etc. How do you know it's not that? Well, obviously, we're looking for the for the truth and for answers to understand what's taking place. So, obviously, we are we are not qualified or have the experience in many areas. So, obviously, we consult with people that have experience, and we've had a number of uh, police officers, uh, some retired and some not, that have given their assistance and have in, in, have briefed us in depth of what satanic cults actually involve and how the procedures are, are conducted on animals for rituals. Mm -hmm. and, and we go through these procedures and they said the majority of them, the animals will be, will be actually dragged to a, a, a low level stream or brook mm -hmm. and they actually be staked into the stream mm -hmm. and then they will actually be excised whatever tissue that's been removed, the, the sacrifice take place and then the blood will run down the stream, there'll be no evidence on the ground, and, and other evidence will be removed. So we're exploring this, and these people are saying that what the pictures we actually show them is not consistent in any shape or form to animal ritualistic killings. Also, there's never any evidence of tracks or footprints around the carcass, which obviously there would be if it was down to satanic cults. Those satanists have got to get onto the farm, 
they've got the added problem, as we've described before, of actually catching the animal, especially in the dark, uh, lifting it into some vehicle, taking it away to wherever, to wherever their ritual is taking place, do the, the business, and then they're risking being caught a second time by taking it back. What about evidence of other animals, foxes, badgers? Um, could these not be caused by, by predatory animals? Well, in, in, in some cases, obviously the animal looks to have been clinically killed and a predator's come in afterwards for an easy meal and contaminated some of the actual cuts and procedures. So there's a combination of two. Now, if animals such as foxes or badgers are actually carrying out these attacks, we should be very concerned because there's good surgeons. And I spent with Robert Hulse uh, two hours, oh no, sorry, it was nearly three hours, with Professor Donald Kelly, a veterinary professor at Liverpool University. Uh, um, he, he was very unhappy about what we were showing him. And he found it very hard to reluctantly admit as we were leaving. We were there at two o'clock, it was five o'clock when we were leaving. And I'd shown him umpteen images, including quite a few of Linda Moulton House from the States. So it was cows, everything. And he, as we were parting, he actually sort of agreed, albeit very reluctantly, that a lot of the cases we'd shown him did not fit into the criteria of natural animal predation and that we could see he was disturbed and bothered by it. These are removal of tissue and organs that even vets that we talked to said they would have difficulty doing these procedures in that environment on the side of a hill in the middle of the night sometimes in appalling conditions they said they couldn't do this or replicate that in their own vet veterinary laboratories. Okay then well what about um, it could be a government secret project um, mm, that makes no sense to us in as much that um, if it was a secret project that was totally covert and, and they wanted to sample the livestock for, for whatever reason, they would be far better off actually buying the animals or the carcasses from the slaughterhouses. It would be much less conspicuous because the one thing we never understand here or in other parts of the world is, is why would you actually sample or take samples from a carcass? and then leave the carcass to be found by the farmer or investigators like ourselves. Well, a lot of people have come up with that notion that government agencies and even the military or parts of the military are involved in um, this covert operation. But A, they've committed an offence because they've gone on the farmer's land, which is trespass in the first instance. They've stolen the farmer, farmer's livestock, which is theft. And then the, the, the if they were doing that, let's just say for a minute, we go along with that idea, that line of thinking, <coughs> they've taken the animal away somewhere, back to some laboratory, to do all these sophisticated um, excision of, of organs and the blood and all the rest of it. Having done that, why would you bother to take the animal back to the location or near location where it was taken from in the first place? Yeah. And, and risk being caught, if not the first time, by the farmer returning the carcass. Feeling slightly frustrated that there seems to be no answer to all of this, I decided to contact DEFRA, which is a government department who deal with farmers and farm animals. I contacted the helpline and explained my concerns. They told me to contact David Sims, a higher executive officer who deals with customer services. I emailed David Sims but he did not reply. I telephoned him several days later and he appeared to have no knowledge of my email. He then said that it was referred to the customer services contact unit and the email had been placed in a general mailbox. I asked him for a name of who was dealing with this. He could not give me one. They appear to have sent me round in a circle. I believe that you actually got a phone call after you placed the advert in the Farmers Weekly. Can you describe that for yeah, us? Yes, that's correct. Yes, it was about three weeks after the advert went out, which is every Friday on Farmers Weekly. And this voice, fem female voice, said, uh, just to check, she got Mr. Caton on the end of the phone. I said, yes, I'm speaking. And then the next line was, I'm calling from the office of the Ministry of Agricultural Food and Fisheries at Preston. She didn't identify herself by name or the, 
where the premises were in Preston. Uh, and this is the sort of tone and inflection in her voice, and this is the way she said, I'll never forget this. Is this to do with the aliens? Not that we know anything about that. And that, that totally took me by surprise. And the fact that she said, we, not I, which suggests she was talking about at least her department, uh, which I established to be at Barton Hall Labs. She demanded to know the name of the professor of pathology who had been assisting me with looking at the carcasses. And I declined to give her that because at the time we decided to keep Tony's name out of the frame in case he got any hassle from anybody. And it suggested by her question, they were prepared to give him some. Farmers have actually paid for a necropsy of the animal to try and determine exactly what and why the animal has been killed. And the report has been very vague and it's concentrated on, on different uh, things that are not relevant to the injuries that have been, have been detected. That they've, they've, they've actually left out the major injuries uh, as unexplainable and they, they haven't, I suppose in some respects, they don't want to really cross that line because they know there's something very unusual taking place. Uh, a number of years ago I, I contacted or actually wrote to 65 vets and given them a, an outline of information even saying I would send free v videos and information packs and I didn't receive a response from one vet. There seems to be some sort of stigma to this particular, particular type of animal death. And then she said, uh, the farmers have no right, Mr. Caton, to give up their dead animal carcasses to the likes of you for unofficial experimentation. So I sort of countered that by saying, but uh, if the farmer, uh, this is not unofficial experimentation, if the farmer decides he would like to know what caused the death and have a post-mortem done to establish that. What by a qualified pathologist as well. By, yeah, qualified pathologist, yeah. And then her response to that was, oh, because of BSE. From which I said, well, are you now telling me we have a problem with BSE with sheep? In June 2006, uh, there was a, a, a mutilation attack on Dartmoor. Three animals were killed and uh, one of these was removed uh, by myself and brought back to the West Midlands for uh, a necropsy report to be carried out by a vet. Uh, only I knew the identity of the vet, the, the farmer didn't know, Phil Hoyle didn't know, uh, my wife didn't know, so it was quite a guarded secret. Uh, however, uh, I had to ring the vet from Dartmoor and tell them that the animal was on its way, uh, so I phoned them on my mobile. About a week later, uh, I, I received a call from the vet who asked me, um, who told me that they'd been contacted by the local environmental health officer and that he had demanded a copy of the post-mortem report on the sheep and also demanded to for them to give details about myself. So I asked her, I said, is this normal? She said, this has never happened before, which I thought was highly curious. She then said, we've taken legal advice to see whether we should disclose this information to the environmental health officer. He said, unfortunately, that, that legal advice suggests that we do have to release your details. How do you feel about that? I said, give them my details and give them a copy of the post-mortem report. Leehurst campus at Neston in Liverpool, which is the main DEFRA university centre for uh, animal diseases. And plainly, they had instructed my mobile phone records to be accessed to get the identity of the vet. David Caton gives another example of government interference. They found two mature sheep mutilated with four inch diameter rectal cores and I think there were other injuries. But they were puzzled that obviously removed them off the field and put them in the barn deciding what to do. Now the following day having put them in the barn the farmer had to go to Leicestershire somewhere on business and was off the premises and during the day that the stockman was sort of looking after the, uh, the place and the silver BMW a state car 
arrived at the gate and they came in the yard and these two gentlemen approached uh, showing Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries identity cards which were green coloured he remembered and they said to him oh we've come for the two sheep so the stockman assumed his boss the farmer had arranged that and so he actually assisted them into their back of the car and off they went the farmer comes back happens to go in the barn sees the missing and says to him well, what have you done with the two sheep so the stockman said oh well, the minister men for the ministry came and removed them I, I thought at your request and the farmer was very cross about that because uh, in his terms, the, the, the MAF had in fact stolen two of his animals, albeit they're dead, but it was the principle of it. They decided to write to me. And uh, this lifelong friend had a brother who was a chief inspector in the Oxfordshire Constabulary. So the farmer said to him, you get your brother to contact the MAF and complain about my stu stolen sheep. Yeah. So <coughs> the police officer duly did that and the first person who answered the phone at the MAF headquarters in London denied all knowledge they knew anything about it. Um, he was quite officious apparently in his tone to the police officer who had some rank and, um, and he, the police officer said well look we've got a witness i.e. the stockman who was shown ID cards from you people so I want to speak to someone more senior and unless the farmer drops his complaint, I'm sort of duty bound to take this if necessary to court. Having said something like that, <coughs> this gentleman then said, well, if I were you, I should drop the case. In any case, the farmer will be compensated. Which, so they did an immediate U-turn then by him saying that. Obviously knew the farmer's address to say to where to send this compensation check to. And then this gentleman got even more officious and said to him, <coughs> inferring it would be damaging perhaps to his career prospects and not in his best interest or whatever to drop the case. And in any case, like if you don't, you'll be hearing from your superiors. And allegedly, sometime later they contacted me and they had been told from high level to drop the case. Sean Limbert, who is an associate of David Caton's, wrote to the MAF and questioned them about this issue. We've been looking into the claims made in your letter that DEFRA, formerly MAF, officials were involved in an incident when a Northamptonshire farmer found two of his sheep dead. In particular, you have alleged that DEFRA, that a DEFRA official warned off a police inspector from investigating the matter further. I can confirm that DEFRA has not been involved in this investigation at any level. Now, in view of the serious nature of these offences, I, I, can, I can also confirm that the police are the relevant authority for the investigation of such incidents. DEFRA have not been known to comment on the mutilation problem. In 1998, however, a statement was faxed to the BBC in Manchester. And it was from the MAF a press office from a gentleman signing himself as Stuart Dobbs and it reads the series of animal mutilation have been very distressing for the farmers involved and the majority of these incidents have been reported to the police as very serious offences and are being dealt with them at present so that infers that the MAF knew this was going on and the police were dealing with things as a result it is not for the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food to pass comment on these incidents as they are being handled by the relevant authorities. And one assumes they mean relevant authorities being the police. Tony Dodd had told me in the past that he had written to, to the MAF and to the National Veterinary College and to the um, NFU, the National Farmers Union, asking what information they had on this topic and he received blank denials from all three of them. So when I made Tony aware of this new statement from their press office, he was uh, quite pleased about it. In addition to the, the, the wounds that are left on these animals, is there any, uh, is there any other evidence that you've, that you've managed to find? Well, what has been reported over the years is a number of farms, the farmer finds unusual ground markings. Now, 
this is a consistency that's also been detected in the US. Now these markings are actually like a banded horseshoe type of markings and they actually uh, range from around 1.5 meters to 6.5 meters across. The actual width of the band is around 200 millimeters across. But inside the band in itself, right next to where the mutilations take place, the grass becomes darker, but the, but the actual soil becomes baked, like it's been some sort of energy or heat has interacted with it. We've even broke the trowels trying to take samples. We've had an analysis done on that, and they said that the actual ground is, is like a ceramic. It's been baked so hard and it's sterile. That some of these banded marks stay on the, on the land for years. But what's interesting is, is that these marks appear usually within a few hundred feet of where the animals found. We, we have done numerous all night surveillances on that part of Dartmoor. Uh, the one thing I can tell you that we've not seen in all the, the surveillances that we've done, we've not seen another human being which is quite extraordinary in itself. But uh, we have seen some strange things. We've seen strange light forms. We've actually recorded these on film. Uh, on the one occasion, I saw a pulsing beam of light. Uh, do these lights come down from the sky, or do they just appear? I mean, They just seem to appear. and. Uh, these lights seem to be coming from the floor of the moor. It, it's really very strange. These things seem to be moving at enormous speed and in an intelligent manner. I have heard it said that some farmers spot unusual lights in the sky when this activity takes place. Have, have you any knowledge of that? Yes, a number of farmers have actually said that they've seen helicopters or sometimes even unconventional types of helicopters that operate in the most unusual ways over the farmlands and in the morning they will find animals that have been killed in, in this manner. Uh, a number of farmers have actually reported coming across uh, covert troops actually on the, on the ground. Right. And also a number of farmers have given permission for exercises to be conducted on their land. Right. Uh, and uh, sometimes in connection to that animals are found in some ways uh, killed and mutilated. Uh, but there seems to be a d degree of unusualness about some of the activity. Sometimes the, the, the farmers themselves are, are quite you know, aware of, of the helicopter activity in the area because we've got one of the largest bases in, of Raff Shawbury, which is local to us. Right. And so there is an enormous amount of helicopter activity. But, but some of these, these lights don't conform always like helicopters, flight characteristics. And could you expand on that? Do they are they silent or? Well, a number of them are not only silent. Uh, they stay stationary for um, maybe an hour or more, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there there are described as being a single sphere of red or white. Uh, some some have actually farmers have actually used binoculars to actually to view these lights because they've been so concerned or, or puzzled by them. Okay, so are you saying that possibly these lights are not conventional aircraft then? Well, they wouldn't appear to be conventional in, in the normal sense of the word. Well, we do know that a number of helicopters have got a stealth inability on the rotors, so they're virtually quiet. As, but, the, but the farmers say that sometimes they use binoculars to try and identify these lights, and they, and they appear as a red or a white sphere with no anti-collision or normal navigation lights. So they're not totally consistent with normal helicopters, and they do seem to hover for quite extended periods of time. And usually, if they see the lights, then animals are found mutilated in the morning or the following days. The APFU were clear to point out that they did not have enough evidence to draw a conclusion as to what these lights could be. In my interview with Linda Moulton Howe, she gives a compelling explanation. And then you come to what Sheriff Tex Graves told me that day in September of 1979 as I was just starting out trying to get to the bottom of what was happening, he <laughs> said, I'm convinced that what we're dealing with are creatures from outer space. Okay. And he said that to me, uh, eye to eye, and when I said, would you please talk to me about this in front of my television camera, because you know I am working on a documentary and I need this for television, he said, no. Right. And I heard off the record from many people in law enforcement 
that this was their personal opinion based on the fact that they had seen beams of light coming out of circles of light in the sky. Some people had actually seen animals rise in beams of light. I set up an appointment with the chief investigator of the animal mutilation phenomenon for the district attorney's office in Trinidad, Colorado. His name was Lou Girodo, and I remember the eeriness of it. We had been traveling and hearing all of these spooky stories. We were seeing and filming animals with these excisions that were bloodless and no tracks and no explanation, and law enforcement is telling me off the record we're dealing with creatures from outer space. Who or what do you think is killing and mutilating all of these animals? And Lou Girotto, without missing a beat, without flinching, and without taking his eye away, looked straight at me and said, well, other investigators and I have come to the conclusion that we are dealing with creatures from outer space. Mm -hmm. And this is with the camera running. To back up these claims, Linda recalls a conversation she had with American Army Intelligence Lieutenant Philip Corso. Lieutenant Colonel Philip J. Corso and I got to talk privately and... He had already read some of my work about my animal mutilation investigations, which surprised me, but he said, you are absolutely right. Everything you've reported is accurate. And he said, when I was working in the Pentagon for uh, the General Arthur Trudeau, handpicked by President Dwight Eisenhower, in the Pentagon, I read with my own eyes highly classified United States government documents about the unusual uh, deaths, bloodless and trackless deaths of animals around the world in both hemispheres. And it stated in the documents that the perpetrators were extraterrestrial biological entities and that uh, the documents were dated as early as 1951. He wanted me to know. That is the answer. If you bear in mind, this is happening worldwide to all life forms. So any agency, whether you're talking government, um, cults, could not account and physically carry out that vast number and variety of mutilations and the variety of species involved would be impossible. This, I believe, is a very, very big secret. I believe that this is an issue that is at the very highest level in this country. And we only find what we find by digging, and, and the, the math will find more because they are being tipped off by certain veterinary practices, you know, the Veterinary Laboratories Association affiliated uh, veterinary practices who were probably briefed up to a point to know to recognise this. So immediately that happens, they are tipped off and will dispatch the recovery team to that farm to threaten the farmer on one hand and remove the, and bury the carcass literally, you know, from the public uh, mind. So now, If we can move it on and say, well, Okay, if this is some kind of unearthly phenomena, let's just call it that, um, if, and the government knows, or certain parts of people within the civil service, whatever you want to call it, DEFRA, know about this phenomena, possibly more than you. Yeah, um, that's a doubt. Um, the reason why they may want to play it down or cover it up is because if they know the true source of whatever it is, and we're not saying what it is, Perhaps that, that, that knowledge is something that they do not want to be in the public domain. No. No. Well, I can have some sympathy with that. I mean, it's very disturbing. The whole subject is very disturbing. Farmers have said to me, you know, what's going on here? Uh, and they're not getting these answers from their own farmer media, uh, especially uh, the government. Some people believe that the Earth has been visited by up to 30 or more races of extraterrestrial. I believe that many of these races probably respect the Earth and the human race. Having watched this documentary, however, you may be thinking, 
have there been cases of human mutilation? For obvious reasons, this is a highly controversial subject, and there are strongly conflicting views on the evidence which is available. I have received a report and police photographs from a case in Brazil from 1988 where the body of a man appears to have similar injuries to those found in mutilated animals. If you do not wish to view these images, look away now. Jaw strip and tongue removed. Surgical holes. Rectal core. Internal organs removed. I am not saying that this man was definitely butchered by aliens, but I think it is necessary to at least mention this evidence. I have also received information from a source I believe to be reliable, but have no way of verifying, that cases of human mutilation have occurred in the UK, and that these incidents have all been covered up by the government. The source also claimed that Margaret Thatcher, acting on a request from Ronald Reagan, set up a secret group to deal with and cover up incidents of human mutilation in the UK. The group was later disbanded under John Major. Our government undoubtedly knows more than what's been screened in this documentary. If you find it difficult to believe that an invisible alien predator is killing our animals and possibly taking human beings, then consider this. If our government knows that there is no defence against this threat, what would be the point of alerting the public? Thank you.